Welcome back to the One God Report podcast. Bill Schlegel here. This episode is part two of Jesus calling God his own father and making himself equal with God, a commentary on John chapter 5, focusing in on verse 17 and 18. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd recommend doing that. And before we get to part two, there was a question that a man named Manny had. I believe the question is related to podcast number 43, Where Does the Bible Say We Go When We Die? Hint not to heaven, an interview with Pastor Sean Finnegan. Here's Manny's question. Yeah, I have a question. What about the souls under the altar in Book of Revelation? I forget which chapter where they're crying out for justice or vengeance uh, to God. I think it's how long until um, there's justice or vengeance. Are those disembodied souls or are those, um, they're still alive, but it seems that they died. Uh, so that was my question. So, Manny, yes, this is from the book of Revelation, chapter 6. I would just say a couple things. We must remember that the book of Revelation is a vision and that whatever is written here is understandable to the people that it was written to in the first century AD. And we understand that as a vision, these images and symbols in the vision represent things. They're not necessarily literal. For instance, when the author sees a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems upon its horns and a blasphemous name upon its heads, it's not a literal beast that existed or will exist, but that beast represents something. So there is no literal beast with ten horns and seven heads, but this represents something. And likewise, these martyrs who had been slain for the word of God were under an altar. They represent the desire for justice, and that even so, there would be others that would be martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. So maybe somewhat similarly in the Old Testament, the blood of Abel was calling out. Now, that's not literal. The, the blood of Abel doesn't speak, but it represents a crying out for justice. And the book of Hebrews says that the blood of Christ speaks louder than the blood of Abel. Well, it doesn't mean that the blood literally has a mouth and speaks, but it's representing a truth. And this is the same thing, I believe, in the book of Revelation. The other thing I would mention is that Sean Finnegan, who I interviewed in that episode, he has done a number of lessons and podcasts on these questions. And one of his podcasts is called Theology for Challenging Conditional Immortality, where he takes a look at five or six verses that are typically claimed to show that there is an intermediate conscious state after death. So I'll link that podcast to Sean Finnegan's Restitutio podcast, Challenging Conditional Immortality. And he has some things to say there about Revelation 6, 9 to 10, the souls under the altar, the souls cried out. So I hope that's helpful. Now let's get to our episode two. He called God his own father, making himself equal with God. In part one, we looked at the meaning of this Greek word equal, as it's translated. And it's best understood in the context of the idea of agency. The one sent is equal to his sender because the sender has granted to the one sent his authority as his representative. The idea of making himself equal to God, it's not describing a metaphysical equivalence as if Jesus had the same divine nature as God or is God. Matter of fact, Jesus is differentiated from God in that verse. And then secondly, we looked more specifically at how Jesus, by calling God my Father, that this is not a claim to deity. Rather, it is a messianic claim. It's a claim to be the Messiah. And as the Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus represents God. Now, the third reason that the traditional interpretation of John 5.18 is wrong 
is the context of the rest of John chapter 5. The language and context of John chapter 5 is all about agency, not essence or metaphysical equivalence. An honest reader will see that the Christology presented over and over again in the Gospel of John is not incarnation, that God became flesh, but rather agency. God is represented by the man Jesus. Let's briefly survey John chapter 5, verses 19 to 47, and see that Jesus is not claiming to be God incarnate, but that his claim is to be God's human messenger, God's sent one. Everything in the chapter snaps into focus and becomes very understandable in this light. Look at a few examples, starting with the very next verse. In John 5.19, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son is not able to do anything of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. Unquote. This is agency language, just like Moses said of himself in Numbers 16.28. Moses said, You shall know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. The Son does not have power, ability, or authority, the Greek word dunamai, to do anything of or by himself. This is because the Son's power and authority comes only as the designated sent one of God. Also note the word sees. Sees is a present active verb, meaning that Jesus continues to do, not something that Jesus did in a past pre-existent state. Also in John chapter 5, verse 20, the next verse, the Father shows the Son all that he is doing. It's a continuing process. John 5, 22, the Father judges no one but has given all judgment to the Son, unquote. The agent is granted authority by the principle. The Jesus of the Gospels, especially of the Gospel of John, makes clear over and over again that all his authority has been granted or given to him. Such statements make no sense if Jesus is a divine, coexistent, co-eternal member of a tri-personal Godhead. John 5.23 That all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Unquote. This verse is used by Trinitarians to claim Jesus' deity. They say, Jesus gets the same honor as the Father, so he must be God. But Jesus' statement is in the context of the law of agency, the Father who sent him. To honor the messenger is to honor the one who sent him. The double honor, so to say, is not because Jesus is of the same essence as God, but because Jesus represents God. Not to honor the messenger is to dishonor the one who sent him. Whoever receives you, receives me. Whoever receives me, receives him who sent me. Matthew 10.40 and John 13.20 Then, John 5.24 Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Unquote. Some 40 times in the Gospel of John, it is stated by Jesus or claim by the gospel writer that Jesus was sent. This is agency language. 525 to 27, Jesus says, The hour is coming, and now is. And then Jesus claimed two specific authorities or abilities granted him by the Father. The Father granted the Son to have life in himself. And the Father has 
given him authority to execute judgment. Again, this is agency language. Jesus has power of attorney given to him from the Father to raise the dead. Compare 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Paul says, For as by a man came death, so also by a man has come the resurrection of the dead. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45b, the last Adam, or the last man, became a life-giving spirit. Because the Father loves the Son, Jesus also has the authority from the Father to judge. Compare Acts 17. He, that is God, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Unquote. We should ponder in awe that God has granted such authority to man, indeed, to a man. Compare Matthew 9, 8. This phrase, the hour is coming, and now is, has an already but not yet feel to it. The deeds of Jesus, like the raising of the dead, are evidences, tastes, that the kingdom's inauguration has begun through him, but it waits final completion. As Jesus says, the hour is coming. John 5.30, Jesus said, I do nothing on my own authority. This is the second time in 11 verses that Jesus says this. Are we listening to him? If not, why not? The Trinitarian take on such verses is that in some way, one person of the multi-personal Godhead doesn't act independently of another. Besides being strange, non-biblical speculation, such a suggestion is blind to the agency being presented in John's entire gospel, the rest of John chapter 5, and in the very same verse. Jesus said, Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Unquote. The agent does not speak or act on his own will or authority, but on the will and authority of the one who sent him. These words can be understood plainly, knowing that Jesus is the sent agent of God. There's no need for speculations about interactions of divine co-equal persons in a tri-personal God. John 5.31 If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. Unquote. The agent with the power of attorney comes with witnesses, evidence of his granted authority. I bought a house in Tennessee with my father, he was in California at the time. I couldn't just go to the loan and title people and say, my father gives me power of attorney to use his bank account. I needed from my father a signed, witnessed, and notarized document. Even so, Jesus had evidence of his authority from the father. First, Jesus says, John the Baptist was his notary his proof of authorization. And then, chapter 5, verse 36, the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Unquote. The works Jesus did bore witness that the Father sent Jesus, not that Jesus was God, Again, this is agency language through and through. Trinitarians completely misinterpret the miracles of Jesus. The works were not witness that Jesus was God or was sent from some pre-existent state. Rather, Jesus' works were like the works of Moses and the prophets, whose works bore witness that God sent them. 
Jesus healing the lame man and the blind man was evidence that God sent him as his agent par excellence. No Old Testament prophet healed the blind or the lame. John 5, 39 and 45. Another testimony, Jesus says, that the Father has sent him is the Old Testament scripture, including Moses. And then chapter 5, verse 41. I do not receive glory from men. Why? Because he's doing the job of a faithful messenger. He only seeks to do the will of the one who sent him. He doesn't deviate from his sender's will. Chapter 5, verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. That's coming as the sent one under the Father's authority. And 544, Jesus said, How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? You see, Jesus sought glory from the only God. Unfortunately, I think a major reason people don't believe Jesus is that they value the honor of humans above the honor that comes from the only God. For Jesus, the only God, is the Father, Yudhivavhe, the God of Israel. So to sum up the third reason, that an equality of divine essence is not what John 5.18 is about. Jesus' discourse following the claim of equality with God is all agency language. The equality is that of granted legal authority, not of essence. Once agency and its language are understood, it's unnecessary to postulate Hellenistic concepts like equality of essence. To sum up our two episodes on John chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, calling God his own father, making himself equal with God, Jesus healed a lame man at the pools of Bethesda near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This is a real place on our earth, uncovered in archaeological excavations. Jesus' healing of the lame and blind are works that God did through Jesus, compare Acts 2.22. And these signs serve as testimony to the identity of the Messiah. The close proximity of the pools of Bethesda to the Temple Mount contrasts the inability of the Judean religious establishment to bring restoration to Jesus, who was entrusted with the power of God to heal. Also, the location of the miracles on the northern and southern borders of the Solomonic city of Jerusalem suggests that Jesus is the promised Davidic king through whom the promised kingdom restoration comes. The timing of the miracles during a festival and on Sabbath are a taste and sample that Jesus is the messianic agent of the new creation through whom all things are made new. And brought to completion. Another point. As the human Son of God, Jesus is God's human messenger or agent par excellence. Agency is a prominent theme in John chapter 5 and throughout all of the Gospel of John. The repeating Christology, who Jesus is in the Gospel of John, is agency, not incarnation. In the same way John 1.1c, the word was God, can be understood as Jesus representing God, God at work in and through Jesus. The Gospel of John refers to Jesus some 40 times as being sent, like Moses and the prophets, human beings, to be sent by God or to be sent from God means to be commissioned, authorized, and equipped by God to act as God's representative agent. The authority of God is vested in Jesus the Messiah, given to Jesus the Messiah. 
Jesus is the one sent by God and is therefore equal to God the Father in authority and purpose. The law of agency states the one sent is equal to the sender. The Trinitarian interpretation of John 5, 17 to 18, that in calling God his Father, Jesus was speaking of a metaphysical unity with God and that the Jews understood him to be speaking so, is out of context with the Hebraic culture and mindset. As the theological blogger Troy Salinger has written, quote, The relationship of Jesus to the Father is laid out in terms of divine agency, not divine metaphysics. When one understands Semitic agency, no postulation of a metaphysical unity between the two is necessary. Unquote. The agency interpretation of John 5 is supported by the Judeans' attitude in John chapter 9 concerning the healing of the blind man in Jerusalem. Quote, Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. John 9.16 And, quote, The Judeans had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Unquote. John 9.24 we know that this man is a sinner. It is clear that God does use agents. It's worthwhile to ponder why God uses agents. And then finally, a note of encouragement and challenge. We are Jesus' messengers or ambassadors, God's ambassadors through Jesus. Jesus prayed to the Father, John 17, verse 18. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And in John 13, 20, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The Apostle Paul concurs. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Messiah, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Messiah, be reconciled to God. Unquote. Like Jesus, we don't speak or act on our own authority. We don't seek our own will. We don't seek glory from men, but from the only God. Yishma'u wanavim v'yishma'u. The humble will hear and rejoice.